Uh, good afternoon, Josia. Uh, tell me name. your full name. My full name is Josiel. My full name is Josiel Travis. I was born uh, December the 23rd, 1917, in Mims. Uh, my mother and father, Lucille Warren and Joseph Warren, Sr. And, and uh, your very historic family. Uh, when, did, when did Joe come here? My father uh, came into this area when he was around the age of three. His father was given a land grant. And who was his father? Uh, George Warren. George Warren. And uh, they came to this area from Augusta, Georgia, by uh, wagon, I guess you'd call it a wagon train, through a uh, wild waste wilderness. And uh, they settled in uh, what is really LaGrange. Part of it's LaGrange and part is Mims, this area that they his land grant uh, covered. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and uh, what year was this when they came here approximately? Do you remember the story? In the 18, seven, late 1869s, uh, early 1870s. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and where is the area that they settled in uh, uh, located? The original home was built on the site where Nevin's Packing House now exists. That was the original home site. It was, he built it out of uh, pine trees. He hewed them and put them together by pegs. That was the original home. I see. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, did, uh, did this extend over to Old Dixie Highway? Yeah, it went uh, across the Old Dixie Highway and uh, well, what is now Parish Road, part of it was on the south side of Parish Road. That's why I say some was in the Grange and some was in Mims, oh. because that's, Parish Road is supposed to divide the Grange from uh, Mims. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, <coughs> and uh, uh, the area that uh, their old estate was on was referred to as the Warren Estate. Uh, and this was uh, belonged to George Warren. George Warren. By uh, land grant. By land grant, yes. Okay. And I, I have a copy of the original land grant. Oh, wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, do you, um, uh, what, was, what was located on this piece of property uh, that was, is of his, his historical significance? Let me tell you, at that time, it was a wild waste howling wilderness. Uh -huh. Wild hogs, panther, bear, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my father uh, told us that uh, the wild hogs would come up and sleep under their house at night to keep the panther from bothering them. Panther wouldn't come up where they could smell humans. I see. And the wild hogs would sleep under the house at night. Uh, I understand that there was a, a little schoolhouse that the Warrens built. Could you tell me something about that and where it was located? Well, that schoolhouse was from my original home place, oh, maybe um, 300 feet from my house because I could run to the school. Okay, and, and, <laughs> and, and where was it? And it was right on the corner of what is now Parish and uh, Old Dixie, Parish Road and Old Dixie. Okay. It was right on the north west corner. The northwest corner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what did the little schoolhouse look like? A two room building uh, with one kind of a square room and then the back room uh, an L shape like. Mm -hmm. And do you remember who attended school there, some of the names? Well, uh, as far as I know, the uh, only people at first in attendance were 
from the Warren, stems from the Warren family, which included the Sims, the Campbells, you know. Okay. Those were uh, among the first people. Then as people populated what we call uh, then North Mims, uh, those children uh, walked to school. There were no buses. So, so do you remember, do you remember uh, uh, them telling you approximately how many children actually went to the school, you know, in numbers? Maybe 25 or 30. It was small, you oh, know. Mm -hmm. that, that was quite mm -hmm. a few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember okay. the names of some of the, the children? And who the teacher was? Who was the teacher there? I don't remember all of the teachers. There was a Reverend Tate that taught there, and um, there was another professor, D.E. White from Gainesville, that taught there, uh, a Mrs. Meeks out of Jacksonville taught there, uh, my aunt, my father's sister, Annie Sims was one of the original teachers. Um, and then, of course, as the time went by, there were uh, uh, Mrs. McDuffie came in and taught one year. Well, it, it was basically a two-teacher facility, that's all. Oh, mm -hmm. Two teachers. And what happened to that? Uh, schoolhouse. The school, I, you know, I'm not so sure if that building, I think it was turned into a home. Now the building may not be there now, but it, up until a few years back it was. Mm -hmm. um, the school, when they moved it from there, it was moved here to Kyla. Oh, it was moved to Kyler. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, on Kyler, the front building part there was the uh, was the original school after it moved. Mm -hmm. I see. And mm -hmm. uh, do you know about what time period this was? Like in the in the twenties or the thirties? It must have been in the late twenties, okay. around twenty. 728, something like that, maybe. Okay, and so did that that become the Kyler School then? Or? Yeah, that became Kyler School. Okay. It was not named Kyler School then. It was. It was. Uh, Mims Elementary. Oh uh, no, it was Colored School oh, 104. Okay, Mims. 104. Okay, Mims Colored School 104. 104. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did um, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, at the Warren Estate, uh, what happened to the the houses that were there? Did they burn down or were they torn down? Well, our home, the original home, burned in um, January 18, 1956. Oh. Um, now, my aunt's home, uh, Aunt, Aunt Annie, uh, her home burned, well, after that. After the Moore accident, her her home burned. Uh, my uncle's home, who uh, was to the south of the school, that property was sold. I think the the parishes when they put the packing house, mm -hmm. that property was sold, and that house, I guess, was torn down afterwards. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, do you re ever remember uh, any Sims? Um, I found uh, a document uh, in the um, uh, county records that Annie had given uh, some land to have an A&E church built on the Warren estate. Was that church ever built there? Do you ever remember a church being built on the Warren estate at all? No, when when that church was built, it was built at the site where it is now. And where is that? That's up on, um, was it Harry T. Moore, isn't it? Yeah. It's okay, on, is that St. John's? No, no, uh, Shiloh. Uh, Shiloh, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, so Shiloh, okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's
with Charlotte. So, so the, the church, the land that she gave out on the Warren estate for church purposes, and it states in there, if a church was not built, it would revert back to, to the, the family. The family. Uh -huh. and, and I guess that did. That's what uh, happened. Okay, yeah. that's what mm -hmm. happened there. And mm -hmm. um, uh, let me ask you this. Um, what do you, what do you, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Crandall Warren, uh -huh. uh, was your uh, brother, brother. Uh -huh. and uh, Mr. Crandall uh, was uh, very instrumental, I understand, in getting a lot of improvements done here in MIMS. What did he accomplish? As a re what were the accomplishments as a result of his hard work in the early days? Do you remember? Well, one thing that he was instrumental in uh, getting a civic league, you know, among the uh, Well, I guess you want me to say black. We weren't black then, we were colored. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and that was a help to the community. He was uh, instrumental in um, getting information regarding the NAACP and giving that ins uh, information to uh, Harry T. Moore and he in turn got the first NAACP chapter organized here. So, um, so he was very in instrumental in as far as civic. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Uh, what do you remember about the Moors? Well, it, she was my first cousin. Oh. Okay. And um, uh, he taught school. When she met him, he was carrying, uh, well, they used to canvas insurance way back, you know, uh -huh. and he was doing that. And then he went to teaching school, and um, like I said, after he got into the NAACP, uh, he started to really utilize it to help fight for justice for the colored people. And I understand he was instrumental in getting uh, uh, the population uh, registered voters. Oh, yes, yeah. And, yeah. and also uh, uh, he was very instrumental to get equal pay for the uh, teachers. Uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you, uh, when he was a principal at um, uh, MIMS school, is that correct, that was college school? What, what, what was he the, was principal of the colored school in Titusville. In Titusville. Okay. That's where this uh, service center is now. Okay. Oh, oh. that's cool. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what do you remember, um, what do you remember about, uh, about them uh, just prior, to, uh, do you remember anything just prior to uh, that dreadful night, Christmas night? Do you remember um, some of the things that were going on at that time? Well, you know, they had been bombing buildings in, um, in Miami. And um, we, were, we were afraid of, for him, not thinking of him being bombed, but we always thought somebody would try to pick him off, ambush him or something, you know, kill him that way. Uh, nobody had, had any thoughts of him being bombed. But uh, the Thanksgiving prior to the bombing, I had a dream uh, that he had been bombed. And uh, I told my mother about it. And uh, she said, well, have you told the rest of the family? I said, no, I haven't said anything to anybody but you. And it just so happened when he was bombed that night, uh, I remember sitting up in the bed. I don't know if the force from the bombing caused me to sit. I have no idea how I came to that position. But I was sitting up in the bed trying to wake my husband up, telling him, Mr. Moore has been bombed. He said, Mr. Moore has been bombed? How you know he? I said, I know it. Just get up. Get up and go over and, you know, and see about it. And so he got up and um, took the car and went on over there. 
Well, he didn't come back when I thought he should, and so I told my mother, I'm, I'm going to walk over there. Now, mind you now, this is in the woods. <laughs> Virtually, you would say it was the woods because there was a grove, and then all around you was woods, you know, palmettos and whatnot. And uh, she didn't want me to go over there. I wasn't really feeling very good at the time, but uh, I got out that night. I never would have walked that area alive. <laughs> but do you know, I walked over there that night without any fear whatsoever. Nothing ever dawned on me. Uh, but of course, when I got there, they had already carried him to Sanford to the uh, hospital because he was dead when he got there. But. Uh, and how about Mrs. Moore? Well, she, she lived. Uh, a week from his funeral, the date of his funeral. Mm -hmm. She lived one week. <clears throat> well, it was a tragedy that uh, something like this happened uh, in the community. Yes, well, you know, like I said, we, nobody <coughs> ever thought of being bombed. We always thought that well, you hear of him if he goes someplace that they'll kill him, you know, shoot him or something like that. We never thought of it being that way, you know, and it, that was really a tragedy. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, his uh, their uh, uh, work that they did uh, for all of the population, uh, not only here but nationwide, uh, uh, for the freedom that the teachers uh, have to know today and, and for the black community. Um, the building of the Harry T. Uh, Moore Center uh, will be mm -hmm. a tribute to their work and I hope that uh, it will be a repository for uh, the uh, history of the area oh, and mm -hmm. uh, of the work that they did to exemplify all of their accomplishments in mm -hmm. the area. Um, I want to ask you something else too. Um, uh, what um, uh, what uh, what are your recollections, uh, or or what do you think the the best thing that has come from this tragedy? What are some of the positive things that have come from this tragedy? If there, if you can mention any positive things, like for instance, the it, it has it, it's brought the community together, the black community together. Uh, has it uh, has it uh, uh, made an awareness that the, uh, people have uh, worked harder, more people are voting for their rights? I tell you, Ben Green said it best when he said, "The man before his time." What he did was really paving a way for uh, desegregation. I guess at the time we didn't know it, but uh, it was opening up avenues for that. <clears throat> now, the, when he was bombed, I had uh, some of the white residents uh, to come to my home and we didn't we had no idea that this was going on you know yes. and we don't want you to think that we are having anything to do with it one family had just moved and bought in Titusville if we had known this we never would have moved here you know so there were people who just came out openly and said, well, we never had any idea that this was going on. Basically, here uh, in Mims and Titus, we had our problems. But the problems, to me, were not as bad as there were other places. Um, now, you couldn't go in a dress shop and try on a dress. Uh, you couldn't try on the hat. Those kind of things uh, 
well, even in Orlando, there were places there that you couldn't even do that, you know. And uh, I think that it really helped to open up the hearts of people as people, black and white. I think it helped to do that. It's mm -hmm. a very positive. We were talking about uh, some of the positive things that uh, uh, that came out of this. Um, uh, and uh, is there anything else that you think uh, uh, the the relationships in the community uh, uh, have developed since then? Well, uh, the development as the results of voting helped quite a bit. Uh, and still is helping. Uh, the fact that um, teachers were, began to be recognized uh, as far as salaries were concerned, they were not given equal salaries as such at first, but they, the salaries were raised. They were making, you know, more money. And uh, then uh, job-wise, uh, it opened up more jobs for people. Our one disadvantage here uh, that we had as uh, colored people was the fact that in our schools, you speak of education being separate but equal. But it was equal only to the extent that if you had a certain amount of students, you could have a certain amount of subject matter. So that our kids in high school, uh, until in the 1960s, were not even taught typing, things like that. So. Uh, I'll say a girl finishing high school could not go out and get a job as a stenographer or a secretary any place because they had no skills. I understand so. in the early days also in the uh, uh, colored schools uh, that uh, uh, that the uh, books and uh, uh, the supplies uh, were not plentiful either. Where, where did the, where did the books? Uh, most of them were secondhand. And when I came along, my parents had to buy every book that I used. Then later, uh, in the 30s, they started handing down the books from the white schools. Well. Needless to say, these books were not in the best of condition. Some of them, the most of them, the backs were off. Some of them, pages were missing. So you were teaching out of a book uh, that everybody did not have the same lesson in. <laughs> you know. Now th this actually happened. This, this. Now, do you remember in the public schools? Uh, did you have extracurricular activities? Uh, uh, like, for instance, did you have uh, uh, the anything in the arts at all? No, nothing like that. How about sports? The only sports at that time was uh, basketball. Basketball. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you remember um, uh, uh, any of the uh, any of the members of the team? Uh, basketball team. Uh, what, for instance, when are we talking? When you were in high school? Well, no, I didn't finish high school. They didn't even have a high school when I finished. I finished eighth grade. Uh -huh. Then I had to go away to boarding school. I did, there was no high school here for Oh, at that color. time, at there that was time. no high school. And what time period was this? This was back in the early 30s. 30s. Okay. Where did you go to boarding school? At Bethune-Cookman. Bethune-Cookman. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. And, uh, and um, tell us something about Bethune-Cookman. Uh, well, it, it was, um, 
Mrs. Bethune was living at the time, and uh, you got to know her. She, she knew every student by name. <laughs> and um, I felt that uh, it was a sort of a cultural uh, center that you learn to do things, you know. My mother had uh, was a graduate of Hampton in uh, Home Ex, and she taught Home Ec at Bethune Cookman at one time. And uh, in fact, that's where my father met her. And of course, when I went there, I was in high school. Uh, Mrs. Bethune walks in the um, home ec room and she tells the home ec teacher, I want you to put this little girl to work. And uh, that meant that I was supposed to start sewing because I guess she thought I knew how to sew. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I learned, I put myself, I tell my kids today, I did not have a free period because I busied myself. I got into everything that I could get into when I was out of my class. I uh, took typing. They allowed me to go down the street to take typing. I learned to type. I took shorthand and uh, I took music. Uh, being in the uh, high school, I didn't have to take home ec, but I busied myself. I got in the home ec room and uh, I learned, uh, well, I learned to sew. I made all of my clothes while I was in school. And uh, I did all of the embroidery, uh, crocheting, edges on luncheon sets. I did all of the crocheting for that. They used to have a bazaar every year. And, uh, oh, I'd be up sometime until 12 or 1 o'clock at night crocheting edges for these uh, luncheon sets. And uh, Do you still have any of them? No. Like I said, the home burned in 56. We lost everything, everything, except what we had on our backs. Oh, yeah, gosh. yeah. All your old photos, everything. Everything, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. But then I got to meet uh, Dr. and Mrs. Philly Brown. He was a president of the Buster Brown Shoe Company. Oh. So I got to meet them personally. And she used to come out and sit on the campus and uh, crochet with me. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I made a lot of contacts with people who came there. There were trustees and um, of the school that uh, I got to know personally, and uh, it, it was a cultural experience. Uh, how, <coughs> approximately how many students were in your class at the time? Do you remember? I had seven. Seven in your <laughs> class. And they boarded, you boarded at the school? Yeah, I boarded at the school. You can imagine my room and board was $17 a month. Wow. <laughs> uh, uh, $17 a month, yeah. <clears throat> uh, do you remember the train that went through Titusville? Did you ever Oh, ride yes. The train? We rode around? the train, oh, any number of times. That was the way uh, my mother's people lived in Daytona, and that was our regular means of going back and forth. This was the McMillans? Yes. Oh. Uh huh. And, um, we rode the train any number of times. I can remember the steam engine. Then when the uh, uh, streamline came along, I remember the first time it came through Titusville. And I went down, I had a cousin of mine, to, uh, to see the train, you know. And well, I've always been a person, I just, Never thought of black and white. If I was going someplace, that's where I'm going, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we went down to uh, view the train, and David was walking behind me, and he kept nudging, nudging me, move on, move on. I said, 
gave it. We want to see her. Move on, move on. He kept nudging me all the time. <laughs> oh goodness! But it, it's it's been an experience. I you know I have lived here all of my life, in and out. When I went to college, I was away for a while, but. Um, I have seen a lot of changes, and as I said, I don't think we had it basically as tough as some other areas because, uh, well, they had some lynchings here, but that was prior to my time. I don't remember any lynchings here as I grew up. How was that? They had now they had a lynching in Daytona while I was there in school. Um, was this in the early thirties? In the early thirties, yeah. This was a seventeen-year-old uh, colored boy that uh, they claim he gave a wolf whistle to some white woman, and some of the family called the Merryweathers uh, got him and drug him down a what we call a shell road. The, the roads weren't paved, but they had the shell as a basic mm -hmm. uh, coating for it. And they drug him down the shell road. I don't know whatever happened to that family. Uh, they kind of kept things hush mouth. It, you know, wasn't talked about a lot. But, but, in, but in this area, it was actually pretty peaceful, wasn't it? It was more or less peaceful, yeah. That, did, yeah. Uh, did the uh, from what I understand, talking with most people, uh, the community lived in harmony most of the time. Uh, there were a few little ups and downs. You had nothing, your little ups nothing and... Nothing to really worry about. Nothing that really... No, nothing that... I don't think we had that much to worry about because uh, you could go just about most any place you wanted to go, you know. That's and, what I understand. Uh -huh. That, that uh -huh. uh, talking with different people, uh, that's what they said. That uh, you know, every, it was it was pretty free to yeah. go and come as anybody pleased, and mm -hmm. everybody were friends, blacks oh, and whites. Yeah. They went to each other's weddings. Well, you know, weddings, my you father know, uh, mentioned uh, when. Uh, the mail, they used to have the buck on the track out here. That was called buck, going to Enterprise. Oh, that was the name of the train? Yeah, they called it a buck. <laughs> buck. <Old> buck. <laughs> and um, uh, that brought the mail into the area. And um, he um, says any number of times he had to go over and pick up the mail and take it to the post office, which used to be uh, where the Holmes Furniture Place is, there was a store, the post office was in that. And he used to have to take the mail over there because nobody would, seemingly in those days, prohibition, you know, people that would lay around the station drunk and, and uh, so uh, he said he went in the post office one day and uh, her name was Becky. Becky Mims, and her people is who Mims was named after. And he said she was crying and said she couldn't get the mail, she couldn't get nobody to go over and pick up the mail for her. And so he said, Miss Becky, I'll go over and get the mail for you. Well, Joe, I don't want you to go out there now and get in no trouble. He said he went on over and walked up on the platform, walked in the place and asked for the mail. Nobody said anything to him. He walked on out and carried the mail back over to her. Um, he had the first packing house in this area. Yes, I had tell us about that. Where was that yeah. located? It was located at the old home place. He had a, this huge packing house where they uh, uh, packed fruit and shipped it. And I, and I understand they also made boxes there? They made boxes, and uh, one of his box makers was Clyde Pirtle. Oh. 
when he first came to this area, that was his first job, working with, for my father. And, and Clyde was a white person. Though. Yes, he was white. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I also, uh, uh, what else did, did Joe do on his farm? Uh, I've read articles, uh, he made the best syrup, right? Well, <laughs> yes, they said. <laughs> Everybody said that uh, his syrup was good. Uh, we never had any problems. <clears throat> we raised, uh, used to have a bean crop. He shipped his beans to New York. Uh, he had watermelons every year. People came from as far as Fort Pierce to buy his watermelons and get his corn. Um, the parishes, Every year they uh, came in, well, Josie, we get the prize melon because every year he would have a watermelon that would weigh at least 100 pounds. Oh, my goodness. And nobody else, they come in, nobody else gets that melon but us. Oh, isn't that wonderful. <laughs> but uh, I know everyone, they always talked about his uh, syrup. And, you know, see, we were right on, that was, U.S. One then, because you did old Dixie. You didn't uh, uh, U.S. One didn't exist until 1925, right. and um, people traveling in the morning. So he'd be out two, three o'clock in the morning with this uh, his juice going on the kiln, and people would smell it and they'd stop and come back. What is that we smell? <laughs> what are you doing here? What are you making here? And um, then he'd have to tell them the whole story and, and then go grind some juice. They had never had juice before and he'd have to grind some juice out for them. And uh, then he developed um, what we called a hot sour. <clears throat> it was made uh, with the juice of the sour orange. After he bought brought his juice to a boil and skimmed the skimmings off it and everything, he would take some of that juice uh, and mix it with the orange juice. And it would be hot and cold and you'd drink it. It was the best tasting thing you ever tasted. Oh, wow. Everybody called it a hot sour. And nice. any time anybody came there, uh, they had never been there before. They had to taste his hot salad. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, I understand Joe was, uh, was just a pure delight in the community uh, in the early days. And he used to take, uh, I have accounts that he used to take up um, some of his wonderful vegetables and, and uh, share it with different people in the community. Oh, he always did. The old people that existed then, Whatever he raised, they got some of it. Yeah, he was. He was yeah, he would see that. Uh, yeah. Well, um, <coughs> uh, what uh, uh, what do you remember about? Um, uh, uh, let's see. How old was was? Did you and Crandall uh, grow up here in in Mims? Crandall was. Yeah, uh, well, Crandall was. Uh, was he six? Uh, well, he was six years older than I was. It was, yeah. He grew up basically here. He he was born in um, Monticello, Virginia. 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 I can't call. <laughs> yeah, he was born in Virginia. Can't call the name of the place now. Mm. It's not far from uh, the um, old cemetery. What, what's the name of that big cemetery? Arlington. Arlington. Arlington, Virginia is where he's supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some of your other relatives that helped to homestead this area because they were a true uh, pioneer family in this area, uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you remember anybody talking about uh, Rachel or Addie? Uh, Addie Warren? Addie Warren was my father's daughter by his first wife. And his first wife was, was Lula. Lula Carraway. Uh, uh huh. Okay. And um, uh, do you remember uh, uh, any of uh, uh, seeing any photographs of any of these? Oh people? yes, I had all that. You know, but like I say, all that's 
in ashes. <laughs> yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, that's yeah. A shame. And they're all buried at the Grange Cemetery. Yes, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, and uh, but they were all really true pioneers of, of the area. Yeah. Uh, do you remember some of the el elder fa other elder families uh, who were pioneer uh, came here in the early days? Some of their their names. Who was in the area when you were a little girl? Do you remember their names? Well, you were talking about the poses, um, mm -hmm. uh, William Grant, uh, uh, his brother Ezekiel Grant, the, the uh, McClendons, the McKenzies. Um, those were some of the older families that were here. How about, uh, how about Sawyer? Do you remember? The uh, Sawyers. Yeah. Uh, do you remember a lady called Carrie Sawyer? Carrie Sawyer. Yeah. And how about uh, Mabel Battles? Do you remember a, a lady named Mabel Battles by any chance? Mm -mm. And of course the Campbells. Well, they, they were all kin people. They were the all Campbell. kin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, t tell us the uh, how your your uh, family, what the names in your family tree, because they're all true uh, true pioneers of the area. What are some of the names that the, that is connected with uh, with your family? Okay, your the Cam Campbells uh, that stem from Lula Warren, the oldest sister. Uh, Tom, <clears throat> Tom Warren, well, his, I found some of his ancestors, but he went up, he left and went up around Gainesville, so he had no, no one around here. Uh, Society Warren that uh, was here in the area, Annie Sims, Valeria Curry, and uh, Ida Curry went to West Palm Beach. Um, Gertrude lived here, but she had no uh, heirs. And my daddy. Okay, so that's that's the cool. basic. I think I think I don't think I would have out anyone, but the Campbells, I guess. And my uncle's society have the largest uh, heritage part, uh, the, the, the Campbells, because uh, one daughter, uh, Agnes, was very prolific, and she had a very prolific family. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And where do they live? She lives up in, oh, uh, she lives she's, uh, in uh, Orange City. In Orange City. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay, and, and that's the Campbell family who lived on North Homestead in North Merritt Island? That's the part, that's part of this, and that stemmed from Lula, uh, Lucy, Lucy uh, Warren, because she married uh, Butler Campbell. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that was the Campbells, uh, you know, starting over on uh, Merritt Island. Yeah, uh, Allen Hurst, the whole over, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> Yeah, there, uh, uh, do you remember uh, going over to the island for visits over there? Oh, we used to go like? over there. Uh, how did you get Woods. over there, first of all? Woods. Well, now, going around to um, Oak Hill side, that road was what we call the shell road. Um, and whenever it rained, the road would be pitted and and you would bounce and bounce and bounce in the car. <laughs> Sometimes you could hardly hold a car on the road, it'd turn around in the road, you know. They used to have to scrape the road. They had a grader, they called it. They kept the uh, road uh, graded. Uh, and that was our way of going over there. But then uh, when you get over there, you're in the woods. Palmetto, uh, flats, trees, bushes, you know, oh. and mosquitoes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How 
I, I said today I don't ever uh, complain about a mosquito because I have seen the time when I would walk out of my house and you do like this and you wouldn't know what color you were. Now that's when I was a kid. You didn't have anything to spray like you're off today. There wasn't anything like that to spray with. We'd have to carry a smudge around, which was inconvenient, but if you were gonna sit in a place, you better have that smudge. Now what's a smudge? <laughs> uh, we'd take an old rag, get some pine needles and some moss and light it and kind of get some coals and put what we used to get, a uh, B brand uh, powder on it, so insect powder. That was the only thing you had to, to repel insects. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember when any big storms came through, what happened, any big hurricanes? Like there was a huge hurricane in uh, 26 and a couple of in, in the old days. What did you do when a bad storm came? How did you get the warnings? You didn't get any warnings. You j well, the old folks used to uh, kind of predict the weather and my father and his brother, they could just about tell you which way the wind was going to blow and when the wind was coming up and uh, I guess they just studied the weather as they grew up and it just became a part of them. But we didn't go anywhere, we were sitting right in our home and we're, that's where we weathered the storms out. The only thing that we ever got damaged from was uh, several trees sometimes would be uprooted but Nothing ever happened to the house as such. Uh, we never got electric lights until um, 1928. Um, on Old Dixie, there was a German family that got electric lights. Uh, they ran a pool to their home. Do you remember their name? Selkis. Selkis? Mm -hmm. Selke. S-E-L-K-E. -E. <clears throat> and um, so when we got lights, we had to pay for the uh, poles running from their house to our house, which was um, two poles, took two poles. Uh, three poles to bring it round to the service. And we had to pay $40 a pole. That's how we got lights then in 1928. I had my first electric iron in 1928. Oh, that's <laughs> And of course we got our, well everything then electric, we got our first uh, refrigerator which was uh, a Frigidaire and um, after that um, Roosevelt was president in the 30s. How about the Depression? The Depression, yeah, well that was a, a hold back to that the uh, I don't remember exactly the, what year. It was in the early 30s though, when uh, we did bank on the corner of uh, Maine and Washington um, was Titusville Bank. That was a bank that we, my father, used to bank there, and he also banked at another bank on the corner of Julia and Washington. That was Indian River Bank. Indian River Bank, yeah. Well, Indian River Bank closed on him. Uh, he didn't lose a whole lot in that one. But the Titusville Bank, say, 
Okay, like I said, he had uh, used to ship his beans and all to uh, New York. Well, he went in at the end of the season to cash his checks and all and put his money in the bank. And he did that one day, and the next day, the doors of the bank was closed. <laughs> uh, needless to say, we never got anything out of it, you know. Then you didn't have the insurance now like they uh, do today on your accounts. So, you know, he never realized anything out of it. But they were hard times in the, in the early... 30s. Well, you know, there were hard times, and I guess we had hard times, but then we raised a lot of our uh, vegetables, and we were able to sell them, and so we managed, you know, and a lot of things that... Uh, sewing, like I said, my mother, made our clothes so we didn't have to worry about buying ready-made clothes and uh, there were a lot of things that we just did ourselves you know mm -hmm. and those who and those who were industrious like that prospered oh yeah so yeah that, yeah everything was okay then and mm -hmm. made it quite well yeah um, what what are the biggest what are the biggest um, uh, improvements that you can say that has happened from the time that uh, you were young uh, to the present time in this area? Oh, automobiles. <laughs> 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 you used to go to town, which was Titusville. We used to have to go either in the wagon, depending on the, what we had to pick up, or by the buggy. And then uh, later we got a car. And transportation has been, I would say, you know, of course now uh, uh, facilities, being able to go to different stores and things like that has uh, been a major factor also. But... Uh, and, and what's the... What's the um, uh, what's the uh, most important thing that you a message that you can give to the youth of today? Uh, to me, they need to just get busy. There's too much freedom. They are too free. Um, when I tell my grandkids, I can, I, I, I didn't even know what the word bored was because I never had a dull moment. I always had something to do. We did house cleaning. I did fancy work. I had help, I did some of my sewing. I had to practice uh, music. You were given an hour to go play. You had something, we had cows. I would help milk the cows, and there was always something to do. I was never bored, I always had something to do. But, uh, and even doing my homework, when we got a radio, when that came in, your homework was first. If there was time to listen to the radio before bedtime, fine. There's too much freedom today. They, they, the kids today, they don't, they don't, even book learning now doesn't help them because they, they don't have to think. This, you know, they don't have to use their minds. And I think uh, to challenge them now to use their minds, busy their hands, do something. And uh, how about the uh, family life? What's the difference that you see? Well, the difference when I came along, my mother was a housewife. My daddy did not allow her to go out to work. That cannot happen today, but the families need to stick together. They need to 
know where the children are. I was, I was in college before I ever stayed out until 12 o'clock. Uh, today you've got your nine and ten year old kids, the parents don't know where they are. My children were in high school. Their, their curfew was 11 o'clock and they knew I better hear a key turning in the door or you better be on the telephone letting me know exactly where you are. Uh, my son was in 12th grade and uh, that was the first time he was allowed to stay out until 12 o'clock. But you are to let me know where you are. Uh, I think families now have, they, well the children have so much freedom uh, that families think that, uh, well, I've, I've got to do this, they, 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 they got to do this, the others are doing such and such a thing, so they've got to be along with them. I don't see it that way. I think that we need to be over our household. That's the way I feel about it. Also, uh, uh, I was told, uh, too, that if uh, children in a neighborhood stepped out of line neighbors would get on. Oh yeah, you didn't. Today, I sit on my carport and I tell everybody, you have this program on TV as the world turns. Well, I sit on my carport and I see the world go by. They want you to hear. Oh my goodness, if, if, if I was going to bore you out, it would almost be in a whisper. Nobody would hear it maybe but you. And if my mom and daddy ever got it back, that would be it. <laughs> But today, they want you to know exactly everything they're saying. And people, and, and I guess I'm kind of bad about that, but when I see it, I said, uh, I have to say something. And people say, well, you know, you're not, you, you're not supposed to say anything to the children. I said, well, honey, I will have to say it. I'll say it to the mom and daddy, but I'm going to say it. I'll let them know they're wrong, you know? But I don't think there's enough of that going on, even in the churches today. They let the kids come in. And they can sit back and they can grin and laugh and talk. Well, when I'm sitting near it, I'm saying something about it. And then when I mentioned to the minister, well, something should be said from the pulpit. Well, you can't say anything to the children today. Well, I would. But you got to take it on yourself to do it. That's right. And parents have to remember that they're parents, <coughs> and adults remember that they're adults. I have yet to have anyone to say to me, don't you say anything to my child. I have yet for a person to even say that. And I think, uh, I think as elders, uh, the responsibility lies in to, uh, to try to uh, nurture the young people as they're coming up, and I think uh, I think children like to have discipline, and they like to, it's a it's a way of showing care. Oh yeah. And, uh, and yeah. I think uh, I think they need more attention. More and, uh, attention. And, uh, and to yeah, keep them straight, as they say. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I thank you for coming today. Is there anything else you would like to add that you can think of about the family, about? Uh, uh, about MIMS or anything at all? Mm, no, not really. Uh, uh, what, uh, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, are, uh, how do you feel about the uh, Moore Center being established here? What, uh, do you think, uh, what, what do you think this is going to do for the community? You know, it would be an ideal thing 
But we have got to educate our children, and I don't see this being done, into what he did. Now this, this is something as a black as black people today. I'm, because I, when I was born, I was a Negro. <laughs> then I became colored. Now, then they said, you're black. Now I'm Asian, Afro-American. So I don't know what I am. <laughs> but as, a, as, as, as black Americans, we, and, and I would say, I would say in Brevard County, because he worked the whole Brevard County. But we need to let our children know. I've met people today that don't even know anything. I've, I've run into school teachers, and this is, they don't, they don't even, know, didn't know anything about this book before his time. The children don't, e well, who was Mr. Moore? I don't know. So we're not telling them. It's not being taught in the schools. We as uh, people in the community, in our churches, basically I would say in the churches, because this is something I have advocated in my church, that we have a bit of black history brought out every Sunday in Sunday school to let the children know who they are, where they came from, and everywhere. I think it's important that the uh, history of the black communities all over should be documented. And uh, unfortunately, in the past, a lot has never been written down. But I think uh, a part of this project is to document it so children and future generations will we'll know what the threads of fabric, uh, how this uh, uh, community was put together. And the people who paved the way that for the uh, what they enjoy today, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that uh, part of the uh, uh, charter of the Harry T. Moore Center and Museum will be a repository uh, to uh, for documentation of the black but community other, and of the rich history and the heritage of the community. Of the community, the that's right. And mm -hmm. uh, I thank you for your time. Well. And, uh, and if you ha ever have anything else that you would like <laughs> to share with us, please call. Okay. And, uh, and uh, your family and the extensions of your family were true pioneers of the area, and we thank them for paving the way for uh, future generations to have a good life here in them.